This seventh beatitude brings us to the summit. The summit of Jesus' teaching. All of the other blessed attitudes which have to do with character building, shaping us that we might become like Jesus. They build one on the other and they all come together in this summit invitation by Jesus to become a peacemaker. And when we respond to that invitation and bring it all together, and go out and be and do what Jesus has called us to be and do, peacemakers, then we shall be called sons of God. Let's pray. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name, by your Holy Spirit, bring this teaching to life, impact our hearts, let us see you in it all and call for, from us by your Spirit a Holy Spirit response. In Jesus' name. Amen. Climbing Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world, as you know, located in the great Himalayas of southern Asia, Everest situated right there on the border between Nepal and Tibet. Reaching a height of over 29,000 feet, 8,849 meters. If you want to know how high that is, that's the height that airline uh, planes travel. So next time you are flying high, for my sake, grant Lord, it might be soon because picking up that international work again. But when you look out of the aeroplane, realize you're flying just about as high as Everest is. Many attempts to uh, mount that summit, 1924. There was an attempt by Mallory and Irvine. They made a final attempt on the 9th of June 1924, but, but they never returned. So no one knows if they made it to the top or not. But then in 28th of May, 1953, that's when I was doing what uh, baby Bella was doing earlier, getting ready to come out of the womb. Uh, any parallels between that and climbing Everest, Everest I leave to your imagination. But on that date, 1953, two people, Tenzing Norgay and Edmund Hillary reached the summit, and this was the first official ascent of the summit of Mount Everest. Tenzing was the uh, Sherpa, and uh, he publicly went on record as saying, oh no, no, it was Edmund Hillary who took that first step. I don't know whether he was being gracious or not, but anyway, uh, both uh, a Sherpa and a New Zealander, I'm saying that for the New Zealanders watching, reached the summit for the first time. Now we are also mountaineers. We are climbing another mountain, the Mount of the Beatitudes. Actually, as you can see from the photograph behind me, it's more like the gentle slopes in the mountainous region of northern Galilee. But it is nonetheless a call to ascend to heights and altitudes in your relationship with God that are mind-boggling. And these first seven attributes, the blessed attitudes, bring you to that summit. And everything that goes on before builds to this point. It's all to do with heart relationship, with yourself, with the Lord, with others. Bring, bringing it all together, it qualifies you to respond to the invitation to become a peacemaker. What comes after this, the eighth and final beatitude, has to do with how the world, dominated by the spirit of this age, will respond to those who live like this. So really we have reached the pinnacle of those attitudes that Jesus describes. And then following on 
Uh, we then discover how we are to respond to those in the world with the salt and light passage that follows. Shine your light, be a salt wherever God places you so that by what you do and what you say, you influence for him. But reaching the summit is an inward journey. It's also an upward journey and an outward journey. There's a vertical direction, the state of your heart towards God, a horizontal direction, the state of your heart towards others. And as you develop one characteristic, that characteristic qualifies you to move on to the next one. While we're talking dimensions, I want you to have two things in mind. We're talking mainly altitude uh, of advancing, going higher and higher up the Mount of Beatitudes. But you need to know this. In order to go high, you have to go deep. The deeper you go, the higher you will go. So, so much of Jesus' attention is focused on what's going on beneath the surface of our lives. Stuff that people don't see so readily. The depth work, very, very significant. We learn that from the natural world, we learn that from trees, we learn that from engineering and the building trade. There's apparently no limit to how high you can build, provided you get the engineering right, which begins with having a strong, firm and solid foundation. The same with trees that have to be well rooted to sustain growth and height. So often, the uh, roots in trees are not always so deep. Uh, you need to know that. Of course, there are some very, very deep roots that go very, very deep. But there's a reason for that. They're searching for water and nutrients. But if they can find water and nutrients near the surface, they don't go very deep. The majority of uh, roots are 24 inches beneath the soil. Surprising, isn't it? Uh, and, the, and, and the largest roots being in the top six inches. But the secret is, they extend two to three times the diameter of the whole shape of the tree, the canopy of the tree. And so it's, it's stability which is the key here. Now I think it's a spiritual lesson to learn from this. Because those roots go as deep as is necessary in order to find water and nutrients. So I put it to you that that illustration helps us understand that you and I need to go as deep as necessary to draw from the Lord the spiritual sustenance from his word, the spiritual sustenance from his spirit, that life-giving spirit. So I encourage you, how deep should you go? As deep as is necessary to produce the fruits of God in your life. But it's all beneath the surface. Now, those who are mounting Everest begin at what they call base camp. So let's, let's continue this analogy. Here we have, I'm going to read for you the whole passage and we're going to briefly summarize. And this is by way of recapping, recapping what we've covered so far. But it has a point, it's relevant to where I want you to be today. So let's read Matthew chapter 5. Verses 1 through 9. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So we begin at base camp. Already base camp is quite high in the Himalayan mountains. Begin at base camp. Our base camp is the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's what everything else is based on. 
And this begins when you realize that you are spiritually bankrupt. You have nothing, nothing to offer God. In fact, you owe him a huge and humanly unpayable debt. You can do nothing to repay it. You can do nothing to earn his grace or favor. All you can do is to throw yourself on his mercy and grace. And the moment you do so, you discover how fully and freely God embraces you and accepts you in Christ. For theirs are the kingdom of heaven. Now, this poverty of spirit leads on to the next quality, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. You see, what happens is this. You begin to feel the deep pain for having offended God. And that pain is quite unlike any other human emotional experience of pain. Because it is not being sorry for yourself, it is being sorry for your sins. It's not self-pity, it's God-directed. See, this is how it goes. You realize that you ought to have lived your life in harmony with God, in relationship with God, and you didn't. In fact, you made yourself his enemy. Even the most self-righteous and the most religious people find that to be true. You realize that you ought to have lived your life for his glory, but you didn't. You've lived it for your own glory. You've rebelled and fall so far short of that glorious standard. So the pain that you feel at this point is deep sorrow for sin. It's not self-pity. Not self-loathing. Simply, not either simply a matter of low self-esteem. It's not about self-esteem. All those things are psychologically damaging. and have nothing to do with your spiritual life. But when you realize that this is between you and God, you don't cry out in pain to God because of what you've suffered. You cry out to God in repentance for the way that you have and I have offended him. Then, and only then, you feel the comfort of God coming in and he will bring you, as only he can, bring you relief from this kind of pain. And that sense of mourning and sorrow for sin and the comfort that brings leads you to the next beatitude blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth this kind of mourning leads to meekness you always know whether people are mourning and wailing for the right thing or the wrong thing because it depends how they respond to God and how they respond to others that's how you know that your mourning has really been produced by a God focus and not a self focus. And so this meekness is the deeply embedded attitude that those who are spiritually mourn have as they mourn before God. It's an attitude that breeds genuine humility, gentleness, a total sense of non-entitlement in your relationship with God and others. You just are so happy to be blessed and every blessing and favor that comes from God you say not unto me but unto you Lord be the glory and in the end you're going to inherit the earth. Now when you begin to face this total emptiness when it comes to your life before God then a hunger, a new hunger, hunger that you haven't felt before it's a deep sense of emptiness and hunger and thirst for what you lack, the righteousness of the kingdom. And so you crave that righteousness. It becomes the overriding spiritual desire of your life. And it begins, of course, with the free gift of righteousness that puts you in the right with, with God forever. But also, it's the desire to live right. It's the desire to follow Jesus' teaching on the righteous life that God requires for all of those who are in the kingdom, for those who have surrendered their life to the life-affirming rule of God. And this hunger and thirst becomes the dominant and overriding passion of your life. And that kind of hunger is the only kind of hunger that God guarantees you will be satisfied 
God will satisfy this. He won't promise to satisfy your desires when your desires are outside him. But when your desires are in him, even if nothing else works, you're satisfied in Jesus. And you have this testimony. God is enough for me. And this kind of satisfied, secure and selfless life will always lead you to be merciful to others. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You are so full of joy that your sins are forgiven. You can't believe it every day. You feel that weight lifted off your shoulders. And that means you immediately want to lift the judgment and burden of other people's shoulders. You will be merciful to others because God has been merciful to you. You're prepared to forgive other people their paltry debt, knowing that God has given you forgiveness for an unpayable debt. And this forgiveness that you've received from the Father shapes your heart, shapes your mind, shapes your attitude, shapes your relationships. You become gracious, accepting, non-judgmental towards others. Whatever they have done, whatever they believe, whatever social class, background, whatever race, whatever religion, you will be merciful to all people because you will affirm what God has done in your life by sharing that with others. You love them. You don't affirm all that they do or what they believe, but you love them and you embrace them and you do good to them because you know that's how God has treated you. You deal mercifully in all of your relationships and this guarantees that you will obtain even more mercy for your life. I want that one, don't you? And then only those who've come so far can come to this Next, uh, beatitude, being pure in heart. This purity of heart is coming close to the final ascent at the summit. The fourth beatitude, hungering for righteousness, I kind of think is, is the high camp. You know, the high camp is the place where they set camp just before they make that final salt. It's very, very high. When you're truly hungering after righteousness, you know that you're getting set to mount the summit. And then step by step you get there and, and now you, you have this attitude of being pure in heart. Your heart is, is focused, your motivation is pure. You're focused on the Lord just as a compass is focused and attracted to magnetic north. You can shake it and shake it all about, but it will still return to magnetic north. And all the shaking that's happened in your life and all the negative circumstances might shake you for a bit, but the inner spiritual compass of direction, of life motivation, will bring you straight back in the direction of God. It's supernatural and it's permanent. And all the while, when you are seeking him out of a pure heart, the vision of God grows and grows in your life. It becomes clearer and clearer and purer and purer, knowing that in the end, this kind of life will lead to an intimate proximity that will be reflected forever in heaven when you will have front row seats as you actually, in heaven, behold Jesus face to face. Now we approach the summit. Only those who have faithfully followed this ascending path, this spiritual path, development, growth of the human soul, move forward in this pilgrimage procession to reach the summit of spiritual life and spiritual achievement by the help and the grace of God. Only those who have encapsulated all these other qualities will be able to respond to the call that waits you when you reach the summit. And that's the call to be God's peacemakers. Where your life is orientated towards healing divisions, bringing people together, refusing to allow conflict to continue, 
I did an illustration at the 9 o'clock, I do it again at 11, and uh, if I happen to point to somebody, don't think that I'm saying this about you, I'm using an illustration, but there have been times when you know a person sitting right at that side is sitting opposite the person at that side because near the twain shall meet. And people can lift their hands in holy praise and worship and you know that they have been shooting out emails, spewing out accusations and hate. They've been talking about one another behind one another's back and then expect God to accept their holy hands and holy worship. Well, that is holy nonsense. <laughs> now, this kind of peacemaking is not just about peace at any price or simply peacekeeping. It's about peacemaking, resolving conflict. Uh, and not just, you know, any old how. It's based on truth and justice. The justice of the kingdom of God. No wonder, Jesus says, people who qualify for this qualify for being called sons of God. We're all sons of God when we come to faith in Christ, but this is, this is a position of honour. It's like a badge of honour and it will be clearly identifiable throughout all eternity and probably recognized by a few people on earth. Don't expect everybody to congratulate you. When you, when you walk the line of a, peace, a peacemaker, they often get shot at from both sides because both want you to agree with them. You have to be neutral, you have to be mature, you have to have the wisdom of Solomon and more to be able to resolve many of these things. But when you reach the summit, it all comes together in the invitation to be a peacemaker and your choice to say, yes, Lord, I want to be a peacemaker. This is what you see when you get there. This is a view from Everest, not base camp, but from the top. Um, the, I think it's a picture by Andrew Town who's done a journalistic, journalistic uh, record of this, and he says, from that height, this is what it looks like. First of all, you have 360 degree vision. You're the highest in the world. There's no mountains taller than you. And I mean, you know, I don't know where, where you live, but you might look out of your window and you've got 12 degrees because there's buildings and stuff. Even in the countryside, it's very rare to get full 360 degrees uh, because you need height for that. But here, on the top of the world, you have clear 360 degree vision. That's why. Only those with such clear vision are able to see all perspectives can action and act as peacemakers. And, uh, you know, he, he says, from here, you, you see all the other mountains, some of them which are, in, are within sight. You see Mount Lotosi, the fourth tallest mountain. And then across the valley is the Cho Oyu, the eighth tallest mountain. Then in another direction lies Makalu, the fifth highest mountain. And he says, it's incredible to look down on the tallest mountains in the world, realizing you're above them all, he says. Now this is not a position of spiritual superiority. It's a, it's a maturation of the human soul. It is coming to the place where you're now scaling heights in God that few, few if ever, really reach. But Jesus invites us all. The view, he says, is awe-inspiring. He describes in his journal, I saw the sun rise and paint the shadow of Everest as a pilgrim, py pyramid stretching halfway into Tibet, across the Tibetan plateau in the north of Mount Everest. And there it is. If you, if you can see here where I'm pointing, that's not a mountain. That is the shadow with the sun behind of Mount Everest. Awesome, awesome. And he says, it's a view quite unlike anything I've ever seen. So what do we see when we reach the summit of the Mount of Beatitudes? The first thing we will recognize is how lonely it is. The higher you go, the lonelier it becomes. You have fewer fellow travelers. As it is in the world, only 10,271 people have ever made it to the summit. Some time ago, only 24% who attempted it made it. Now, it's about two-thirds because of the technology that's helped in recent years. But remember, of the few who attempt it, 
They only do so after careful preparation and training. So it is really a very rare thing to say, I climbed Mount Everest. At, from this height, there's a greater perspective, but also a greater opportunity for discouragement, for misunderstanding, temptation to compromise, and to turn back. As I was reading up on this, I found that there were some really, really sad stories. Not only people who left, lost their lives, but there were a group of people who turned back 900 feet from the summit. Another person turned back 300 feet before they got to the summit. Now you need to know how difficult it is. Coldest temperatures, 60 degrees centigrade below zero. Facing hurricane force winds, avalanches, the chilling factor, the chill factor, the wind chill factor, the thin air, which is one third the air pressure at sea level, making it difficult to breathe. You've got altitude sickness, you've got supply issues, weariness, fatigue, tiredness. And all these things have their spiritual equivalent. There are the chill winds of Everest proportions blowing over Christian faith and testimony in our society today. More and more discouragement from the world and sometimes from within the compromising church. Turn back. Don't be fanatical. Don't go further. Who do you think you are? You're not better than us. No, I'm not. But I want to reach the summit. I want to hear the well done from Jesus. I want to be able to receive that maturity, knowing that I have lived in a way that honours God. And I want to hear the invitation and be qualified to respond to it, become a peacemaker for me. But also, when you go to the summit, you are surprised. I kind of had that experience myself, although I know this scripture very well, but digging deep into it and reflecting on it, I was surprised. Actually, I was astonished. Following my own logic, the logic of my own interpretation, that this is the summit, how extraordinary that the pinnacle, the peak of Christian attainment and Christian experience and Christian maturity is that you become a peacemaker. How do we value that today? It's certainly not the priority. If that were the case, there wouldn't be so much division and, and wars and barriers and unreconciled relationships within families, within the body of Christ and in society. Who would have thought that the highest call of the kingdom, the height of spirituality, would be to become a peacemaker? But as I thought about it, I really wasn't so surprised. Because when you think that God's great mission from Genesis to Revelation is a peacemaking mission. To redeem all humanity and to reconcile all things to himself and to establish his rule of righteousness, justice and peace. And that peace is not just the absence of hostility. It's the positive establishment of everything that the Hebrew word shalom means. It's enrichment. It means healing. It means fullness. It means prosperity. It means total well-being. Thank God that his mission is a peacemaking one. And he says, join me in this primary mission. And to be effective, you need to be like me. That's why peacemakers are called sons of God. This is really the whole story from Genesis to Revelation, from creation, the mission, the fall, redemption, and the final revelation of Christ's glory at his second coming, the victory, the overthrow of the spiritual powers in heaven who brought about all these divisions on the earth. Some people divide because they feel spiritual. No. Actually, I won't use the opposite of that word, but they are being motivated not by the spirit of Christ, but another spirit. It's not a hallmark of your spirituality because you are so singularly detached from the body of Christ that you are so superiorly, superiorly 
positioned in such a way as you, you alone have the truth and you don't need anybody else. That's a sign of sheer fleshly immaturity. Oh, no, no, no. Jesus came to heal, to bring together, first of all, to deal with your personal conflict. That's where it begins. Most often divisive people, they are divided inside themselves. They are struggling with personal conflict, unresolved issues, marital conflict, family conflict, brothers against brothers. Don't forget the first murder was Cain and Abel between two brothers. Group conflict, which is being promoted today, setting one group against another group. National conflict within a nation international conflict between nations and as the Bible takes us further into future history global conflict but we don't forget in it all and through it all the shame of church conflict division within churches division between churches we've got a lot of work to do he's calling peacemakers are you one of them God's goal is for you to join him in establishing this kingdom of global peace. I don't mean that like a Miss World candidate. Well, what, what is your dream? Oh, I'd like to see world peace. Well, God bless her. I'm sure, I'm sure she does. But th th this is real. And neither is it joining those pressure groups and those activists who use every other means outside of the kingdom to try and bring what only the kingdom can bring. This has to come from God. This has to be God's intervention, first when he came to die for our sins, and secondly when Jesus comes again to bring us together and to bring peace. A number of years ago I was uh, witnessing to a Jewish friend of mine, he belonged to the liberal synagogue, and I asked him in a conversation, not confrontationally, I asked him, why is it that you don't accept Jesus as the Jewish Messiah? Without even thinking, he answered, very simple, where's the universal brotherhood? I said, what, what do you mean? Well, when Messiah comes, our scriptures say there will be universal brotherhood. Where is the universal brotherhood? And he changed the subject. What I wanted to come back and say was, look around. Come to Kensington Temple on Sunday morning. Here we are. This is the universal brotherhood. Go to any church. We are joined together in unity in the Spirit of God. Whatever our race, color, culture, background, we are one in Christ Jesus. But that is not so visible to the world. We have to make it visible. We are showcasing a form of United Nations that the United Nations can never bring about. It's brought about by the blood of Jesus Christ and the unity in the Holy Spirit. One of the things I'm looking forward to doing is when I finally step aside as senior minister in the month of October to have more time to work and to build on inter-church connections and unities. It's not that we don't do this now, but so much as a senior minister has got to be in building up uh, the people in front of you and, and being the pastor of those who are attached to the church shepherds of the flock. And I hope to have more time to preach this message to wider audiences. Well, there we go. God's goal is to bring universal brotherhood of saved humanity, men and women in relationship with each other, with our Heavenly Father, based on God's mercy, justice, truth, and peace. Amen and amen. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen and Amen. So we are called to be agents of peace. How do we do this? First of all, preaching the gospel of peace. Don't go into social justice or some other form of social gospel. Stick with the message. Pronounce peace. Proclaim peace. Isaiah 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns, the kingdom of God. Now then, that doesn't mean to say you don't get involved in all the social justice issues, but you do it from a kingdom perspective. You're called to be a peacemaker in every dimension 
of human relationships begin with yourself, then with your family, your community, your workplace, your people group, and go on and on, and you never stop until you see Jesus return. That's why this will designate you and set you apart to be called a son of God. This is a designation that is earned. We all are children of God the moment we believe. But this is we have demonstrated publicly to God and to others that we have adopted the primary quality that God has which is being a peacemaker. The whole story of God summarized there. Amen and amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. As I've invited you today to stand with me on the summit of Jesus' teaching of these blessed attitudes, I make no pretense that I stand here in reality. I'm still climbing. I also want to encourage you. You don't have to wait until you're perfect and mature before you do this, but always make sure, because the analogy of climbing once and then coming down again doesn't work. In the spiritual life we go back again and again to base camp. We move again and again to high camp. We approach the summit and we go back and we keep on building and building and building all our lives. And so that every aspect of the character that Jesus is building in us is, is reproduced and developed and grows to maturity as we respond to his invitation to be peacemakers. This is how people will know that you are like God, the greatest peacemaker of all. So I leave with you Jesus' invitation. Become a peacemaker. Do all the work, all the preparation, so you have the maturity of character, wisdom and knowledge, submission to God and his spirit. And make sure that you go from here, make peace, build peace, call that person, listen to what they have to say.